It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. And, uh, good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. After six long years, we all know how this government works. The Premier cuts deals, insiders cash in, and the people of Ontario are stuck paying the price. Fresh reports from the Narwhal tell a familiar story. Missing records, interference from the Premier's office, and a familiar name when the Premier needs to apparently get something done, Ryan Amato. It turns out that Mr. Amato, the same staffer who was passing brown envelopes from lobbyists and government members to sell off the Greenbelt, was also involved with another scandal-ridden government project, the Highway 413 uh, Bradford Bypass. So my question is, what role did the Premier have in rerouting of these routes? To reply. I recognize the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Look, our intention couldn't be more clear with the 413, Mr. Speaker, and the Bradford Bypass. We're going to build both highways and we're going to continue to build Ontario, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Let me give that member of the, the Leader of the Opposition a bit of a history uh, check here. What happened on June 2nd, 2022? Let me remind you, your government and your, sorry, your members opposed, your party opposed the building of 413. And what did that result in? You lost every single seat in Peel Region. You lost three members. It's about time you and the Liberals get on board and support building highways across this province because we need to get people moving, Mr. Speaker. The people of this province spoke loud and clear in their need and desire to see this uh, province move forward with those highway projects, and nothing will stop us from moving forward and getting those highways built. Supplementary question. Well, uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and that was a lot. Uh, but look, before he became a key figure in the Greenbelt scandal, Ryan Amato worked as a senior staffer for the Ministry of Transportation. Records show, and there are very few records, I'll get to that later, but that Mr. Amato refers to directions coming directly from the Premier to him to explore the rerouting of the Bradford Bypass. And this is, I'm going to quote from uh, something that Mr. Amato wrote. He wants to know the cost of moving it further north, said Mr. Amato, and, and that he is the Premier. So I want to go back to the Premier again. Can the Premier clarify what direction he gave Mr. Amato about rerouting the Bradford Bypass and why? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, this government is following the direction of the people of this province that elected us on June 2nd, 2022, with a historic majority mandate to build highways. Which highways? The Bradford Bypass and the Highway 413, which the Liberals and NDP continue to oppose. I asked that member, the Leader of the Opposition, Come to our communities in York Region and Peel Region and Brampton and Mississauga to see the gridlock firsthand. The NDP don't want anything built in this province, whether it's supporting public transit, whether it's supporting and making sure we are building the highways that we need, whether it be the 413, the Bradford Bypass, or supporting Highway 11 and 17. They want to stop every single one of our projects. They want to build roadblocks against every single one of our projects. We have a message for the NDP and Liberals. We're going to get shovels in the ground in every single one of those projects, and nothing Response. will stop this government. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, i got to tell you, it seems impossible that a massive project like this, uh, there would be so few records at the Ministry of Transportation that are related to one of what they consider one of their signature highway projects. The limited records that we do have show Mr. Amato emailed the Ministry of Transportation bureaucrats asking about the cost of rerouting the Bradford Bypass at the Premier's direct request, and then nothing. Nothing. No more paper trail. No more emails. No more notes. It just all disappears magically. You would expect to 
see, at very least, I'm going to say, pre, uh, Speaker, some kind of follow-up after a request directly from the Premier. But strangely, the trail ends there. So my question again to the Premier is, where are the records? Thank you. Members, take your seats, please. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The 413 and Bradford bypass have been discussed for 20 plus years. We've got studies on the books from 20 years ago, environmental assessments, public consultations. But here's the difference. Whether it be the Liberals or any, the Liberals who didn't do anything for 15 years, the reason we're in such gridlock today is because they opposed every one of our projects, didn't build public transit, highways. The NDP are no different. They don't want anything built. They just want studies and consultation. But that's the difference between our government, Premier Ford, and the PCs. We get things done. Done, Mr. Speaker. We get shovels in the ground. Whether that's Highway 413, Highway 7, the Bradford Bypass, or public transit across this province, we're building. We're building for the future. We're building for the next 10, 20, 50 years. A vision that the NDP and the Liberals just don't have, Mr. Speaker, because they don't want anything built in the province. They want to oppose every single one of our projects. They want to oppose public Response. transit that moves 400,000 people a day with the Ontario Line. They want to oppose the 413 that saves people 35 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Stop the clock for a minute. So, I'll stop the clock for just one second. I hesitate to interrupt question period, but it, this pattern continues where members don't make their comments through the chair. And I'm going to remind the Minister of Transportation to make his comments through the chair when he's responding to questions. Thank you. The next question, start the clock, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. I'm not getting clear answers, uh, so and, and not from the Premier clearly. So I'd like to ask the Minister responsible at the time if she can shed some light. This question then is for the President of the Treasury Board. Despite his senior role in the Minister of Transportation's office, the Narwhal reports that there are very few records of Mr. Amato's work on the fi Highway 413 or the Bradford Bypass, including route changes. It's almost like he was a ghost. We've seen this happen before, Speaker. Uh, in her report on the Green Belt, the Auditor General revealed a pattern of conservative staff working on the Green Belt file, deleting emails, and using personal email accounts to get around the rules. So my question to the Minister is, did government or ministry staff under your watch delete emails related to work on these highways? Again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Remind the Leader of the Opposition. The response, the Minister of Transportation. The people of this province have spoken loud and clear on these projects, whether it's the Bradford Bypass, the Highway 413. We won every seat in Brampton, Mr. Speaker, three that were held by the NDP. We won every seat in Mississauga, Mr. Speaker. We are winning seats across this province that we never had because of our vision to build this province, whether that's in Windsor and building highway, uh, highways in Windsor or the investments that we're seeking in Windsor, whether that's in Peel Region, whether that's up north, Mr. Speaker, or in Waterloo where we're building Highway 7. This is a government that is committed to building highways, $27 billion over the next 10 years, public transit, $70 billion over the next 10 years. And guess what? The NDP and Liberal have opposed those investments every step of the way. Every LRT project, every subway project this government has put forward, they have opposed. Response. And that's a shame, Mr. Speaker, because this government will continue to get it done. And the supplementary question, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, let's recap. Uh, in his role at the Ministry of Transportation, Mr. Amato would have been in very close contact with anyone impacted by the changes to the highway route. But there are no records of these interactions. He would have been in contact with powerful landowners who would later find themselves benefiting from preferential treatment from this government. The Toronto Star, the National Observer, they've all reported that a large number of these same landowners are friends of the Premier or donors to the Conservative Party. Some of these same people stood to gain from the Greenbelt carve-up. So my question again back to the President of the Treasury Board is, was she aware that the Premier made requests to her staff in her office to reroute the Bradford Bypass? 
Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been clear. The people have been clear on this project, Mr. Pe uh, Mr. Speaker. We have we took these projects to the people of this province, whether it be the Bradford Bypass or the 413 Highway 7 or projects across Ontario. And guess what? We got a resounding response from the people of historic mandate uh, from people. I think the NDP should should ask themselves, you know, what benefit do they get from opposing these projects? There's a reason construction workers are leaving your party in droves and joining the PC coalition yeah. under the leadership of Premier Ford and the Minister of Labour. There's a reason you are losing historic uh, support. It's because you don't have a vision. You don't want to build. You want to do exactly what the Liberals did for the last 15 years, which was build absolutely nothing in this province. And that's a shame. This government will stand up for workers, good paying jobs, and will make sure we get transit and highways built in this province. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock. Um, and again, I hesitate to interrupt, but this continues. I'm going to ask the Minister of Transportation to make his comments through the chair. I'm going to ask all the members to make their comments through the chair. If they don't, I'm going to stand up and interrupt either their question or their reply and remind them in the middle of their question or their reply. This is a parliament. We make our comments through the chair. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, uh, you know what the people of Ontario didn't vote for? They didn't vote for a government so deeply. Stop the clock. Government side will come to order. Start the clock. The Leader of the Opposition has the floor. Again, I'll tell you what the people of Ontario didn't vote for. They did not vote for a government that is so focused Order. on making deals for their insider friends that the people of Ontario are left Order. behind every single time. You should be ashamed of yourself. Does anyone, anyone, anyone in this government know? What is happening in their own ministries, Speaker? Nope. Here's what I'm seeing time and time again the Premier cuts deals, insiders Order. cash in, and the people of Ontario are stuck paying the price. Was this another signature attempt to make Question. a few of the Premier's insider friends rich while Ontarians are left holding the bag? Government House Leader will come to order. Members will take their seats and to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you who the people of this province voted for and what they voted for, Mr. Stop the clock. I'm going to call the Minister of Transportation to order. You have to make your comments through the chair. Start the clock. Through you, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what the people of this province voted for. They voted for a government that believes in, in building Ontario. They voted for a government that wants to build highways. They voted for a government that wants to build public transportation, not a government or opposition that has no vision for this province, that calls you know, projects, fantasy projects, projects that they doubted every step of the way, which we have shovels in the ground on, whether that be on the Ontario Position line, come to order. whether that be the Bradford Bypass, the Highway 413, Mr. Speaker. I have a message for the Liberals and NDP. Nothing will stop us from building in this province. Nothing will stop us from building Highway 413, the Bradford Bypass. Spot. On Highway 7, we will continue to leave a legacy of building infrastructure in this province, and that is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to get it done. The next question is the member for London West.
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's failure to ensure the financial stability of Ontario's post-secondary sector is putting our province's future at risk. Students can't thrive, our, our economy can't thrive, our communities can't thrive when our post-secondary institutions are underfunded year after year after year. Almost half of Ontario universities are facing deficits this year. Colleges and universities are bracing for the impact of a multi-billion dollar loss of international student tuition, which is going to mean program closures, cuts to student services, staff layoffs. Speaker, does this government understand what is at stake when it refuses to properly fund our post-secondary system? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, that's why our government made a historic investment of $1.3 billion earlier this year to stabilize and modernize Ontario's post-secondary sector. Speaker, we did not stop there. As a small business owner, as well as working and volunteering in the not-for-profit sector, I know that any business or organization can always find ways to be more efficient. Speaker, that's why we launched the Efficiency and Accountability Fund so that our public colleges and universities can undergo third-party reviews to identify institutions where they can drive long-term savings, Speaker, for positive outcomes for the students and for the communities they serve. Speaker, the response to this fund has been overwhelming. Schools right across this province, including those with very strong financial stability, have asked to be part of this great Spons? initiative, Speaker. Speaker, our schools understand that the opposition refuses to acknowledge that the solution to the long-term sustainability and success is not always found by throwing taxpayer dollars at the system. Yeah. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, you're not going to fix a $2.5 billion shortfall with efficiency reviews. I'm sorry. Uh, one year ago, this government's own panel of experts said $2.5 billion was urgently needed just to keep the sector afloat, and that was before the changes to international study permits. This government's response, half of what the panel called for, with nothing to address the loss of international student tuition. For decades, Speaker, Ontario has had the lowest per-student funding in Canada and has happily allowed international student tuition dollars to fill the gap in public funding. Instead of, uh, instead of pointing fingers at the federal government, why is this Premier refusing to accept its basic responsibility to properly fund our colleges and universities? Thank you. Members will take their seats. Minister. Colleges and universities. Thank you, Speaker. Part of that $1.3 billion was $903 million of the post-secondary education sustainability fund, Speaker. $700 million went over three years across the board to all institutions, Speaker. On top of that, we also have a $203 million fund that allows institutions that are in larger financial need to be able to be financially stable. Speaker, 20% of our colleges and universities received a 15% increase over last year's Base funding, Speaker. On top of that, 22 per cent of our institutions received a 10 per cent increase, Speaker. We are fiscally managing the situation, Speaker, and through this targeted approach, the Ministry will be providing significant financial support where it is needed the most in the sector, Speaker. But as the member opposite spoke about tuition, Speaker, I think something for the people watching at home, Speaker, under the Spons? NDP government, tuition went up 36 per cent, while inflation was only 13 per cent, Speaker. Under the previous Liberal government, Speaker, Speaker, tuition went up 77 per cent when inflation was only 29 per cent. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy and Electrification. The previous Liberal government damaged Ontario's energy system. Under their watch, electricity rates skyrocketed, increasing by 300 per cent. 
These out of control prices made it harder for Ontario families to get by and for businesses to thrive. Speaker, our government must be focused on reversing this damage. That's why it is critical that we demonstrate leadership and ensure that Ontario families and businesses have access to affordable energy. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government's reforms, including the Affordable Energy Act, will lower Question. energy costs for new homeowners and promote economic growth? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Speaker, the previous Liberal government's costly energy experiments placed an unfair burden on Ontario's families. They signed long-term energy contracts at prices up to 10 times the market rate, and families bore the brunt of these expensive experiments. Our government's taking a different approach, one that prioritizes affordability. Through the Affordable Energy Act, we are extending the amortization period for energy infrastructure from 25 to 40 years, which will lower the cost to homeowners. This reform will save families thousands of dollars in connection fees, making home ownership more affordable. Additionally, this modernized framework ensures that businesses can expand without the excessive costs they faced under these liberal failed promise, uh, policies. These reforms Spons. are a key part of our strategy to build an energy system that works for everyone, not one based on ideology. Great policy. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, clean, reliable and affordable energy is essential for a strong economy. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government's policies increased costs for families and businesses in the province and drove away investment. Under the Liberals, Ontario lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs and businesses faced some of the highest industrial electricity rates in North America, which harmed our competitiveness. In contrast, our government must build for the future with a focus on keeping energy rates affordable. Speaker, could the parliamentary assistant explain the Affordable Energy Act, how it will address Ontario's Question. growing energy demand while keeping costs down for families and businesses in the riding of Newmarket Aurora? Thank you very much. And to reply, the Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that question. Speaker, the Affordable Energy Act is about Ontario's future, where energy demand is expected to increase by 75 per cent by 2050. Unlike the Liberals, the failed approach, which left us with high bills and unreliable power, our plan is focused on affordable solutions. Expanding nuclear energy, with currently providing over 50 per cent of Ontario's electricity, is central to to our strategy to providing reliable, affordable energy. It is emission-free, and the Ontario Energy Board confirms it is one of the lowest cost source of power, cheaper than wind or solar. Our government has created 860,000 jobs and attracted $45 billion in EV and auto investment. Affordable, reliable energy is key to attracting investment and ensuring a prosperous future for Ontario without Response. repeating the costly liberal mistakes of the past. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, to the Premier, the government, this government closed Service Ontario sites run by Ontario business owners and handed them over to Walmart and Staples. They're handing over LCBO sales and revenue to Circle K and 7-Eleven. Yesterday, we saw the 34 bids submitted to redevelop Ontario Place, including many from Ontario entrepreneurs and businesses. But instead of showcasing Ontario ingenuity, this government chose to hand over Ontario Place's parkland for free with a $1.5 billion subsidy to Austrian and American corporations. My question is, why does this Conservative government continually shun Ontario entrepreneurs? Respond, the Minister of Infrastructure. 
very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I will respect the process of the Integrity Commissioner. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd be more than happy to speak in this House about the progress that we're making on the Peel Memorial Phase 2 redevelopment in Brampton. We issued the RF recently this brand new this new hospital will be serving Bramptonians mr. speaker and let's talk about the Grandview Children's Treatment Center in Durham uh, Durham region mr. speaker which uh, construction comp was completed in early October so while the members opposite will be busy protesting and filing complaints this government will focus on building Ontario and providing the services that are important to the people of Ontario question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. The CEO of Infrastructure Ontario admitted that all applicants were not told that the government would pay for the on-site parking at Ontario Place at a cost of $650 million of taxpayer money. And now that we have seen the list, we know that all applicants did not receive the information. So my question to the minister is, why did the Conservatives give Therma preferential treatment? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite can spend all day disrespecting the Integrity Commissioner office, but I will not. What I will do, Mr. Speaker, is talk about, for example, uh, the Michael Guerin Hospital, the brand new patient tower that we are building that are going to serve hundreds and thousands of constituents in Toronto. And let's talk about the Mount Sinai Hospital redevelopment, which Order. I've had the privilege of touring this summer, which will also serve and provide health care to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of constituents. Now, while they don't know What's important to the people of Ontario, this side of the House does, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to build this province and improve health care across the province of Ontario. Thank you. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. As we know, our population is rapidly growing, and it's important that we have transportation infrastructure needed to keep up with the people. And we need to keep our people moving in our communities all across the province. Speaker, families in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore tell me every day that they are so tired of bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Whether it's going to a medical appointment, dropping off their kids at school or extracurricular activities, or just driving home to see their families, gridlock is making life harder. The previous Liberal government knew there was a need to build our future, but they sat by as the problems got worse. Mr. Speaker, we can't afford to wait any longer for new roads and highways. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the voices of the riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore removing those bike lanes on Blair Street. <laughs> Question. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is building highways for the future? Uh, Parliamentary Assistant, member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you very much, Speaker. Because of this Premier's strong leadership, our government is focused on getting people out of gridlock. That's why the Minister of Transportation introduced the Reducing Gridlock Saving You Time Act, which will allow 24-7 construction on our priority highway projects. This new legislation, if passed, will designate priority highway projects so that we can build faster and keep people moving. Priority highway projects means faster construction and less time for commuters stuck in traffic and more time for them to spend with their family. We are reducing gridlock, not removing traffic lanes. We know that after 15 years of Liberal inaction and endless gridlock, Ontarians need relief. By cutting red tape and streamlining construction process, we're building faster. After 15 years of Liberal inaction, we can't afford to wait any longer, Speaker. We need to build. Response. Under the leadership of this Premier and this Minister of Transportation, we are building Ontario. Supplementary question, the member for Etobicoke Lake. Well, Speaker, I just want to say thank you because we know that the Liberals don't want to see transit built in Ontario. They voted against it every time. Their leader, Bonnie Crombie, is on record saying that she never supported the 413, and she certainly doesn't support the concerns of the people in Etobicoke Lakeshore. The people of Ontario deserve better. They are tired of spending valuable time in traffic instead of home with their loved ones. 
you know, people want common sense solutions. They want to make their lives easier. You know, our government must do everything they can to build highways faster and get drivers out of gridlock and get them where they need to go. Speaker, can the minister please outline how this legislation will benefit our highway projects and get people home to their loved ones quicker? Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the amazing uh, member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for all of her advocacy. By designing highway priority highway, sorry, by designating priority highway projects such as the Bradford Bypass and Highway 413, we can build faster and avoid construction delays. Ontarians are already seeing the benefit of 24-hour uh, construction. Under our plan to tackle gridlock, we've accelerated construction of the Gardner's Expressway. That Gardner's accelerated timeline is now four months ahead of schedule. Whoa. Okay. Speaker, it's clear. The status quo approach from the NDP and the Liberals simply will not tackle gridlock crisis. Tearing down highways and removing car lanes only makes gridlock worse. Yeah. Speaker, we're the only party with a serious plan to Response. build and get construction projects done faster. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. Working without protective equipment, wildland firefighters, treated by this government as second-class first responders, these firefighters are exposed to life-threatening levels of toxins 16 hours a day for six months, all while working and sleeping in carcinogen-saturated uniforms. It is critical to recognize their level of exposure by counting fire seasons as full years of service. The minister claims to have done this, yet it is not in the latest Working for Workers Act. Can the minister please explain why the government voted against the NDP's amendment to count a single fire season as a full year of service? The parliamentary assistant and member for Ajax. Thank you. Through you, Speaker, we did what the previous Liberal government did not do in 15 years of, ser of service. We included fi wildland firefighters on the same presumptive WSIB coverage for occupational ca cancers and heart injuries as municipal firefighters because they earned it. Bill 190, Working for Workers 5, passed last week with unanimous support from our NDP and Liberals to send to support for our frontline firefighter heroes. Within that committee, we recognize that already our Ministry of Natural Resources does recognize the season as a year. We committed to Mr. Freeman in that committee that we will examine what is being looked at under WSIB, and we continue to work with WSIB to clarify this issue. Okay. Supplementary question. New question. Sup supplementary question. To give them the protection and the pay they deserve. And yet, now he says that only the Treasury Board Minister has the power to make these changes. Speaker, these wildland firefighters don't need excuses. They need protection and results. Minister, will you uphold your commitment to reclassify these workers and make a single fire season count as a full year of service as they deserve? Members will take their seat. The Minister of Natural Resources will reply. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, as the organizational review of firefighter classification by the OPS is underway, it would be inappropriate to comment further. But we have heard comments from the PA and Labour this morning on the, re on the uh, expanded Order. coverage piece. But, Mr. Speaker, what I want to talk about is how we've invested in wildland firefighters in Ontario. You know, the, the opposition and the Liberals did not increase the budget to $135 million, a 92% increase. We did. The opposition Liberals 
did not put $5,000 in the pockets of wildland firefighters in Ontario and other support workers within AFFES. We did. The opposition Liberals and the NDP did not make sure that on uh, standby and on call opposition come to order. were put into action. We did. They also did not create 100 new FPEs in the last years. We did. Mr. Speaker, we have been behind our fire rangers all the time, all the way. We will continue to be behind Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kanata Carleton. Speaker, what is it going to take to make this government take the family doctor crisis seriously? This government is failing Ontarians in every corner of the province. Yep. In the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore's riding, 21,000 people do not have a family doctor. Wow. And in the member for Mississauga Aaron Mills riding, 23,000 people do not have a family doctor. This government is willing to borrow $3 billion for a pre-election giveaway, but they won't spend a third of that amount so that every Ontarian can have a family doctor. Order. So it's quite clear we can afford better health care. This government doesn't want to invest in the people of Ontario. They just want to invest in the next election. Ontarians side want to order. family doctors. I'd like to ask the Premier Question. why doesn't his government? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, the member opposite can have her own stories, but she can't have her own facts. And the facts matter in this. No, there is no doubt that our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, has, in, has been investing in primary Independent care members come north. Speaker, when you for Ottawa South come new north. medical schools that are starting schools that are starting in Brampton, in Scarborough, in Vaughan. Stop the call. I'll remind the members if you refuse to um, respond appropriately to the request of the Speaker to come to order. If I have to speak to you again, you will be warned. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Health still has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. The, the inconvenience of hearing the truth yeah. from our side is getting the opposition upset. But I'm going to continue to remind opposite that as we're expanding medical schools in Brampton, for Orleans in, will come to order. in York Region, House the, will come to order. the party opposite, Response. when the Liberals were in power, were cutting residency speeds. They were cutting medical spots. We are making the investments so that for decades to come, those people are going to have opportunities to train and teach and learn in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Member for Don Valley East will come to order. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, here's the facts. Here's the truth. 2.5 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. And each week, when the cabinet ministers meet, the most powerful people in this province, they do nothing but accept the status quo. No help for the Street people of Ontario, and universities will not come to even order. their own constituents. The truth, Mr. Speaker, in Chatham-Kent Leamington, the Associate Minister of Emergency Preparedness has 31,000 constituents without a family doctor. The Minister of Agriculture, MPP for Elgin, Middlesex, London, silently accepts that 38,000 of his people don't have a family doctor. And to top it off, the Minister of Infrastructure does nothing to help the 40,000 people in Etobicoke Centre with without a family doctor. I'd like to ask the Premier, on behalf of all of his cabinet, Question. why do these 109,000 people in just three ridings not deserve a family? Minister for Red Tape Production will come to order. To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, when I see over 300 nurse practitioners practicing in the province of Ontario in multidisciplinary teams, yes. right. 3 million Ontario residents who are accessing nurse practitioners in multidisciplinary teams. But, Speaker, imagine, imagine if you would, 
that the the member for Don Valley East is warned. The Minister of Health still has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Imagine, Speaker. Warned. The Minister of Health has the floor, and I want to hear her answer. Speaker, imagine if when the Liberals, when they were in power, hadn't cut those 50 residency spots, those medical seats, we would have 300 physicians in the province of Ontario. We would have 300 young people who didn't have to go overseas to get their medical training. Imagine if they'd actually planned and understood that Ontario's population was aging and growing. We are making those investments. We will continue to make those investments. Exactly. And I just hope at some point, when they get an opportunity to vote in the next... Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question, the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Park. To the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. We all know how much veterans mean to our province. They fought for our freedom and safety, putting their lives on the line. These veterans gave so much to build our communities, and they deserve our respect, not just in words, but in real actions. These actions must respect the dignity of our veterans and honour their contributions to Ontario and Canada. The Honouring Veterans Act is a chance for us to stand up for our veterans and give them the respect they deserve. Speaker, how will this act ensure that all veterans are honoured and respected for their service and sacrifice to our province and country? And to reply, the member for Markham Thornhill and Parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to my colleagues from Halliburton, Kowata, Lake, Brock for that important question. Veterans played and continue to play a pivotal role in our securing our nation, past and the future. The Ontario government is proposing the changes to the Remembrance Day Week Act 2016 that would, if passed, better recognize and honor all the veterans, including those who served as well as those who gave their lives. Our government is proud to honor the invaluable contribution to our veterans. Mr. Speaker, in partnership with the Royal Canadian Legion, Ontario Provincial Command and local community partners, we will be introducing the new award to recognize and celebrate Spons. the significant impact veterans have made to the broader community. Mr. Speaker, this bill will build on our commitment to give veterans the recognition they deserve, including their contribution in their... Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you uh, to the parliamentary assistant for the great response. I know that I'm proud to say that family members uh, fought in World War I and World War II for our country. And the current veterans have put their lives on hold, faced dangers, and fought for our freedoms as those before them did. And so did today, when they come back home, many veterans face challenges, like finding new jobs or getting the help they need. And Speaker, we must also recognize the sacrifices of their families. This new act promises to make life better for veterans. It promises them more support, more opportunities, and more recognition. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this act will connect veterans and their families with new opportunities for employment and financial support when they return home? That's a great question. Number four, Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, my colleague, for the supplementary questions. Our government is honoring the veteran not only by working to expand provincial recognition, but also increasing the financial and community support for veterans and opening more career pathway for veterans and military families as well. Speaker, the legislative and regulatory changes in this bill, once passed and implemented, would increase financial assistance and improve access to services and benefit to the veteran and their families. Mr. Speaker, veterans have made tremendous sacrifices to make our country and the province what it is today. And we need to be there for our veterans when they need us. Speaker, 
That's why we are proposing to increase the amount of funding an eligible individual can receive through but the, through the Sold Years Aid Commission and to make it easier for eligible veterans and family members to apply for funding. Speaker, this government stands with the brave men and women who serve our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for to Ms. Kimming Cochran. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, this week there was a tragic incident in Cobalt and our uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the victim of the attack and the families involved and our thanks to the OPP and the first responders. Uh, last week the Minister of Finance talked about the increase in the OMPF funding, what it was going to mean to municipalities. To the municipality of Cobalt, that increase was $16,600. But the increase in OPP bill to the town of Cobalt is $110,704. If it fully transferred, a 15% municipal tax increase. Wow. I will ask the Minister of Finance which basic services he suggests that the municipality of Cobalt and others cut. And to reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to my colleague from Temiskaming Cochrane, repeat, I'll repeat what I've said in the House before. We will absolutely listen to our municipalities. This morning I met with the Mayor of Red Lake, who is with us today. I will continue to engage in discussions. We will continue to review the invoices that were sent to the municipalities. And at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, as I've said in the House before, the OPP, which is a flagship police service second to none in Canada takes care of almost 75% of the land area. Over 300 municipalities depend on the OPP, and our government will always prioritize our public safety, and we will work with our municipalities as well. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, to the Minister of Finance. So this government has often said they are proud they have never increased taxes. Last year, the municipality of Cobalt had to raise their taxes 13 percent to provide basic services. This year, they will have to raise their taxes 15 percent just to cover the OPP bill. And we agree, they need the OPP. This isn't about the OPP. This is about the provincial government abdicating their role in municipal services. So when will, the municip when will the province step up to the plate and actually help municipalities before they actually no longer can provide basic services to their residents? Members will please take their seats. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, I'll repeat it again. We are going to engage our municipalities. We will listen to them. Mr. Speaker, two million calls were received by the OPP last year, and the OPP responded to an incredible 1.2 million calls. Throughout Ontario, throughout the enormous size of Ontario, 75% of the land area is protected by the OPP. People who put on the OPP uniform, Mr. Speaker, deserve to be paid a fair wage for the incredible work they do. And that's why our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, will always listen to the municipalities. We are reviewing this matter, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to prioritize our public safety morning, noon, and night. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Haldeman, Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. As he is aware, there is a proposal from Empire Homes to dump a city of 40,000 within one of the province's largest industrial parks at Nanticoke. This harebrained idea was tried in the 70s at Townsend, just down the road from Nanny Coke. It was to be a hub with shops, trails, schools, an athletic centre, a train station. Large swaths of farmland were turned into wide parkways, municipal offices were put in. But, Speaker, it was not the field of dreams. Nobody came. In fact, only 161 hectares of the slated 35,000 were ever developed, one of the largest development failures in the province's history. And you can imagine, I get asked why Empire Homes is not being encouraged to develop where infrastructure already exists and where conflicts with new home buyers and their industrial neighbours can be avoided. And God knows we need to retain those jobs at the Nancoke Industrial Park. 
The Ontario government continues Question. to hold on to 567 hectares of land at Townsend, and my constituents are curious. Speaker, through you to the Premier, could you please inform the people of Haldeman Norfolk what the plans are for the 567 hectares at Townsend? Thank you. To respond. The Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much for the question. I'd be happy to take this back and, and sit down with you and meet with you. The province does own real estate, as you know, in the province of Ontario, uh, and there is a process that is followed. There's due diligence work. Um, the federal government, municipalities can come forward uh, and raise their hands if there's a purpose, and then, of course, there's dispos disposition that occurs, but I'd be happy to sit down with you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. You see, the reason I'm asking the question is because the people of Haldeman are folk, they're quite wary of land deals as of late. They've seen a bunch of bad ones, and they, they look at what's going on down the road at Wilmot Township. And over the past few weeks, my office has been trying to pin down which jurisdiction the 567 hectares of land is in. In an attempt to pin this down, we were told the land is being held for social purposes. We don't know what that means. Speaker, it is my understanding that the land is actually currently being held by the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs and Economic Reconciliation. Speaker, through you to the Premier, why has this Order. government transferred the Townsend Land Assembly to the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs and Economic Reconciliation? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Well, social purpose means that it, there may be uh, an opportunity to build long-term care homes in the province of Ontario. There may be an opportunity to build affordable housing. And so whenever we are looking at government lands, we are assessing to see if long-term care homes or affordable housing or any other social purpose can be met. I think that is a good view for government to have, especially in a housing crisis, especially when we're attempting to doing our best to to build 30,000 uh, beds across the province to service our most vulnerable. Again, I will, I will take it back. Happy to sit down with the member opposite. Uh, but we've accomplished a great deal with surplus properties and building more long-term care and affordable housing units in the province of Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Great, 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 Under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's health care system struggled. Hospitals were crowded, wait times were long, and there was not enough health care workers to meet the growing demand. But our government is working to fix that. Under the Premier's leadership, we've made big investments in health care. We're building new hospitals, supporting health care workers, and making sure people get the care they need. A strong health care system can only happen if strong colleges and universities educate our medical leaders. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what the government is doing to help Ontario students train for health care jobs so they can work in our communities that need them? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker. As the Minister of Colleges and Universities and a proud college graduate, I cannot say enough about the incredible work that's being done in our post-secondary system to build up Ontario's health care workforce. Speaker, I'm sure the member from Cambridge is well aware that in the last school year, our government introduced the Ontario Learn and Stay grant. This grant covers the full cost of tuition provided they study and work in an underserved area across the province. Speaker, I'm pleased to report in that this short time, the Learn and Stay grant has already helped close to 7,500 students begin training in nursing, paramedicine, medical lab technician programs across the province. Speaker, let me repeat that again. Close to 7,500 students will soon graduate as healthcare workers for underserved communities throughout this province in the north, the east, the south, and the west. Speaker, they will be delivering the critical healthcare services families in Ontario Bonds. rely on each and every day. Speaker, Unlike the previous governments, this government is taking an all-hands-a-deck approach to supporting students in every way possible. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's good to see that our government is taking real action to fill health care jobs in our communities. Unlike the previous Liberal government, our government is focusing more on medical training and helping more students become doctors. It's great to see how our government is expanding medical programs, unlike the Liberals who cut medical residency positions. In the recent fall economic statement, there was new plans to improve the Learn and Stay grant to provide even more support to healthcare students. 
Speaker, can the minister please tell us about the changes to the grant and how they will help medical students and the people of Ontario? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for that question. Speaker, I'm very excited and proud of our government with the expansion we are making to the Ontario Learn and Stay grant and believe it will be a game changer for our health care system. Speaker, just the other week, alongside the Premier, the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance, our government announced, starting in 2026, medical students willing to practice as family doctors will be eligible to have their full tuition costs covered under the Ontario Learn and Stay grant. Speaker, this expansion will support over 1,300 future family physicians, getting us closer to the reality that everyone who wants a family doctor in Ontario will have one, Speaker. We're also requiring that 95% of Ontario graduate med students space will be reserved for Ontario students because we know that when people study, they'll stay. Speaker, this government is proud to be supporting our doctors, nurses, medical lab technicians, and more. From the classroom to the practice, we're building a pipeline of health care workers. Unlike the last Liberal government, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This week, the Ontario Trial Lawyers released a report revealing a disturbing trend at the License Appeal Tribunal. In 2023, adjudicators sided with insurance companies over injured people a whopping 90% of the time. So does this government really believe that 90% of those injured in an accident don't deserve the help they paid their insurance companies for, or is something else happening at the lab? And to reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to, uh, to being able to address this. It's, it's quite interesting. The Ontario Trial Lawyers Association are a very important part of our, our justice ecosystem, and, and they've done reports over time. But what, what I can tell you, pulling from that report, in 2017, when the Liberals were, were uh, in charge, I was going to say running the province, Mr. Speaker, but there wasn't much happening. But there were 367 decisions coming out of the License Appeal Tribunal. Well, I can tell you now there are 300 percent more happening, Mr. Uh. Speaker. When, when we, when we came to government, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, we were asked to deal with the backlog in, in the License Appeal Tribunal, and I can tell you we have achieved that. We have dealt with the backlog, and we are meeting our targets, Mr. Speaker. And the NDP and the Liberals were saying, you've got to deal with backlog, deal with backlog. So we did, and we got to balance, Mr. Speaker. Now they're asking us to Spons? interfere in independent decision-making by a tribunal, Mr. Speaker. That we will not do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, 90 percent, but it gets worse. That same report by the Ontario trial lawyers found that a major government side come to order hired an adjudicator while they were still working at the tribunal. Whoa. Rather than immediately resign due to conflict of interest, this adjudicator continued to work for the tribunal for months. And during that time, this adjudicator sided with insurance companies, including their new boss, over injured people 100 per cent of the time. So what is this government willing to do to ensure that injured people finally receive fair justice when going up against big insurance companies at the License Appeal Tribunal? Yeah. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I'll tell you what, what the government is prepared to do. The government is prepared to let an independent tribunal be independent, Mr. Speaker. We receive recommendations for appointment from an independent process. We, we process those appointments. They are administered independently, Mr. Speaker. And if there is a concern Order. with an ind individual adjudicator or an individual decision, we maintain an appeal structure, Mr. Speaker. And so we want to make sure that the initial hearing is heard by somebody who is appointed uh, through an independent process, who hears matters through an independent process, who has a, a, an ability to do appeals if the decision doesn't appear fair to either party, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we'll continue to do, Mr. Speaker. We will put more and more resources in as we have, Mr. Speaker. And I would welcome the, the support of the NDP and the Liberals as we put tens of millions Spons. of dollars into the tribunal system, Mr. Speaker. But to date, they have supported none of it. And the next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Northern Development. 
In Northern Ontario, we know that our businesses face unique challenges. Resource-based industries are the backbone of many communities in the North. These industries create jobs, they keep our towns alive, but they cannot do it alone. Unfortunately, they must deal with higher costs, from energy to transportation, making it harder for them to stay competitive. Without support, it is hard for them to grow, to keep people employed, and to contribute to the local economy. We've seen programs come and go, but the need for sustained support remains, Speaker. Can the Minister please tell Question. this House what our government is doing to reduce costs and provide ongoing support to Northern Ontario businesses? <laughs> Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Brantford. Brant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Sault Ste. Marie. I appreciate that question. Speaker, the Ministry of Northern Development has two incredible programs that support large-scale businesses in the resource extraction industry. The Northern Energy Advantage Program and the Northern Ontario Resource Development Support Fund assist businesses with energy costs and support municipalities in improving roadway infrastructure so that these businesses can keep working. All 144 municipalities are eligible for the Northern Ontario Resource Development Support Fund, and funding is distributed to eligible municipalities by March 31st of each and every single year. Response. And, Speaker, we are increasing our investment in NEEP, expanding the program's budget from $120 million annually to over $206 million annually by 2020. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Northern Ontario doesn't just rely on our resource industries alone. It depends on partnerships with Indigenous communities to grow economically. These communities deserve to benefit from the region's land, resources and developments. We know resource revenue sharing agreements are a way to bring much needed funds back to First Nations and Métis communities. These arrangements help create health, education and economic development opportunities building a stronger future for everyone in the North. But we hear from communities that they need more agreements, collaboration and support in order to reach their full economic Question. potential. Speaker, can the Minister please share how our government is working with Indigenous partners to expand resource revenue sharing as we support our Northern Ontario communities? Response. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you again to the member from Sault Ste. Marie for that great question. Speaker, in addition to the support that we are providing the North through programs like NEEP and NORDS, we are putting money back into First Nations communities through resource revenue sharing agreements. Speaker, resource revenue sharing agreements represent an important part of economic reconciliation by enabling Indigenous communities to share in the economic prosperity of aggregates, of forestry, and of mining developments. Speaker, our government has eight RRS agreements with First Nations and Métis organizations, six agreements representing 40 First Nations communities, and two agreements Response. with organizations representing Métis communities. Speaker, we welcome the opportunity to work with First Nations on signing further agreements. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Last week, Community Care for St. Catharines and, Sor and Thorold, one of the region's major food program providers, reported their highest number of families served through their food banks in a single day. 269 households. Listen up over there. Last year, over a 12-month period, one member and remind her to make her comments through the chair. I am listening. Apologize. Through the chair, through the chair, 103,000 residents used the, the food bank in St. Catharines and Thorold. As of September 2024, they had already surpassed that number. 
a whooping 40% increase in the total number of clients served Question. through the local food bank. Speaker, to the Premier, when will this government finally commit to doubling social assistance, stop clawing back to veterans on ODSP, and that will end legislative poverty Thank you. and allow Thank you. families to The Minister for Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank my honourable uh, colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, this government has taken tangible actions to improve, Mr. Speaker, the, when, at, a, at a time with the rising costs on everything across the country. We've taken actions to reduce costs for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. When you, we increased the Ontario Disability Support Program by 17 per cent in two years, Mr. Speaker. We went a step further. It's indexed to inflation so that it can keep with the rising cost every order. year, Mr. Speaker. We invested in this member for St. Catharines will come no to order. Child, and your student goes hungry in schools, Mr. Speaker. We also, when it comes to the ODSP program member that the Hamilton member referenced, come to order. we increased the earned income threshold from $200 to $1,000 so that those who can quest, want to work are able to do so without it impacting their benefits. Mr. Speaker, this is on top Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.